Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event, When a Comet Becomes a Crisis, What to Do When Going Viral Happens to You. My name's Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow here at Government Technology. Guys, this is going to be great. There, there's a lot of good lessons to be learned about this, and I know you're going to have fun over the next 60 minutes. Now, before we begin, just a couple of brief housekeeping notes. We will make a recording of this presentation available to everybody. It will be emailed to you within 48 hours. Now, you can use this recording for your reference, pass it along to your friends. It's interactive, so make sure you use that Q&A bottom. A button down at the very bottom. Uh, we, we live for questions on uh, uh, webinars like this. We want to answer your questions, get to as many as we can. So make sure you use that. Uh, at the end of the uh, webinar today, if you want to download a PDF, you can do so by clicking on Webinar Resources. There's a widget at the bottom of the console. And then also on today's webinar, just to make sure you shout out using hashtag DevTechLive, whether it's over Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, keep inviting your friends to it because we have plenty of space. Now, at the close of the webinar, there will be a brief survey about the presentation. We, folks, we do want to hear what you think. We've made improvements. We've changed some of the things we've done based upon your feedback. So make sure that you're able to uh, stay on as long as you can. If you can't stay for the whole thing, make sure you fill it out when it pops up. Uh, and there's a red survey widget at the bottom. Otherwise, it will pop up once the webinar concludes. Now, at this time, make sure you disable all your pop-up blockers. Um, if you're experiencing any issues at all, we've got Edward from our crack staff here at ON24. We'll be glad to help you. Just type your questions into the comment box there or visit our webcast help guide. So now let's get to the fun part. So joining me today on this very timely topic, we've got Bronwyn Mishler. She's with Skagit County, Washington as a communications coordinator. And Anil Chavla, he is the founder and CEO for Archive Social. But before we get to them, what we're going to do is I'm going to kick it off. Uh, we're going to talk about social media by the numbers. Then Bronley is going to come on talk about when a comment becomes a crisis. We'll talk about the legal aspects of social media use. That will be Anil. And then we'll finish it out with your questions. So let's kick this off and let's talk about social media by the numbers because there's really only three numbers you need to worry about with social media. And the first one is exactly what it is. The first one is the First Amendment. This is one of the biggest issues we deal with in public sector, public safety. Um, in all of those different areas. So the, the, uh, the First Amendment key issue is for the most risk that you'll run into. It's some of the most contentious areas. It's not the technology. It's the policy. It's the laws. What do you do? Can you ban certain comments? Can you delete comments? How do you track those? These are all questions we're going to talk about today. So the second thing, the number, what's the number two thing? Well, there's two things behind this. And what we found out is people want two things. They want transparency first. They want to see how government operates. They want to see what goes on when the citizens can't be there. And I know in our biannual surveys at the Center for Digital Government, we have found the top two issues are transparency. The second one is accountability. What's, why do you have transparency? So that you understand if you need to hold your public sector, your, your elected officials, and your paid officials accountable for their actions. So we found transparency accountable are the two big things. But what's the third thing? that always seems to pop up. Well, those third things, and this is something I've been uh, pretty bullish on talking about, is that I think we need to look at differently about how we roll these things out. So the first thing you got to do is you got to worry about your policy. you got to figure out what you want to do because it's like going on a trip. If you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. Well, if you don't have a policy, then basically any way is acceptable. So let's just figure out, let's first put down on paper, let's figure out what's our policy going to be? What are we going to do and how are we going to do it? The second thing, now this training dog, and what does training dog say? He says, then you've got to train people. You've got to give them the behaviors you want um, before you even allow them to the technology. So think about driving a car, right? You're in a car. What's the first thing you do? You go into class. You learn the rules of the road. Then you start driving simulators. That's the training. And get the behaviors that you want. And then and only then, you get the really neat stuff. This is the F-117, affectionately called the Frisbee. It's the stealth fighter. Folks, I guarantee you no pilot gets to sit in that thing even for fun until they've gone through tons of classroom, they've gone through simulators, and then they get to fly the fun stuff, right? So that's what you should think about your social media. What's your policy? Let's train people on what we want them to do, and then let's give them access to the technology. Now, let's round this up on somebody who needs a lesson in the proper use of technology. Yes, this is Lindsay Lohan saying, hello, Facebook. Yes, this is actually Lindsay. Welcome to my Facebook page as she announces it to the world on Twitter. So obviously somebody didn't read the policy book there. So let's talk about this now. I'm excited to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Bronley Mishner. Now, she has worked in government communications and social media since 2008. She served as the Deputy Director of Communications for Snohomish County, Washington, during the March 2014 OSO landslide. And that was a tough thing to handle. So, Bronley, that's kudos to you. I know that that was a tough time. Uh, she managed the county's social media pages during the slide and then received national recognition for her effective use of social media as a primary emergency communications tool. You're going to see that's a common thread about how we're using social media 
to report and communicate things. So she's presented several webinars um, and assisted the city of Marysville during its October 14, 2000, 2014 high school shooting, and most recently helped the Skagit County Sheriff's Office manage fallout from a viral Facebook post, which is what we're going to talk about um, today. And actually, it's Skagit. I, I was pronouncing that wrong, so I apologize for that, Bromley. So uh, prior to her work with Sonohomish County, she helped manage the popular uh, WS.Traffic, so the Washington State Department of Transportation, I assume, Twitter account. And then also she worked as a local newspaper reporter. So you'll see that come out as well. And she currently serves as a communication coordinator for the county. So you can connect with her, and we'll put all of this information out there on LinkedIn or over uh, Twitter at Bronley Mishner. So Bronley, let me turn the floor over to you, and let's get this thing started. Sounds great, Morgan. So for those of you who are on the on the call, it looks like we've got a little poll question up here. So many of you oh, may I'm not sorry, know. Yeah, and Bronley, that's my mistake. I should have introduced that. Let me let me do the poll question real quick because I just I actually had a glitch on the slide, folks. My apologies. So let me kick that real quick and then turn it over to you, Bronley. So let's get this. Uh, let's talk about you folks so that Bronley can have something to talk about. So what's your opinion of social media as a public record? So um, it might be a record, but your activity is not worth retaining. You feel strongly it's not a public record, or you don't know. So the first one should actually be you feel it's a record. It might be a record, but it's not worth retaining. You feel strongly it's not a public record, or you don't know. So remember, that top one should be it definitely is a public record. So let's take a look at what the folks said. And again, my apologies for getting that out of order. So uh, folks, some folks say, hey, it is definitely a public record. 15% uh, say it might be a record, but not worth retaining. And 23% of you feel strongly it is not a public record. So we'll probably have to dive into that a little bit too. So Bromley, my apologies. Now let's kick it over to you. Sounds good. Thanks, Morgan. So yes, we will talk a little bit more about social media as a public record uh, with Anil here later. But for right now, we're going to talk about our little viral social media post. So Many of you may not know where Skagit County is. We are up in the northwest corner of Washington. We're a very small uh, rural county, uh, lots of agriculture. We have tulips. You may have heard of our tulip festival. And we, uh, like everybody else in the country, are not immune to some of the concerns going on around law enforcement. So our sheriff's office is on social media. Actually, several of our county departments are on social media, and they have been on social media for several years. I just took over as the communications coordinator about six months ago, and one of the things I'm trying to implement is some policies and procedures and training with regard to social media, all of the things that Morgan talked about. So many of you, if you're working in communications or doing social media, have heard from your elected officials or perhaps from your directors, your administrators, yeah, well, it's just social media. You know, it's not a big deal. It's a new thing. You know, not everybody's using it. And I think we can all safely say that social media is, is no longer new, although there are new social media applications coming out all the time. And it's no longer a novelty. It is really one of the great ways to communicate with your audience and network and share information and really engage your community. So we don't get to just say, oh, well, it's just social media, because it's not. It is a, a primary communications tool for a lot of us. And for us here in Skagit County. One of the challenges, of course, of having social media is how do you herd all of the cats? Uh, in a county, unlike a city, we have elected officials. They are accountable really just to themselves and to the voters. And then you may have some department heads who work for elected officials but are responsible, in our case here, to the Board of Commissioners or to our county administrators. So. I don't necessarily get to tell my elected officials who have their own social media pages what they can and can't do. I don't have that authority. But what I can do is try to get some training into them and get some training for their staff so that not only do the elected officials understand the reach and value and relevance of social media, but they understand how to effectively use it as government. Because you all probably know using Facebook personally and having your own Twitter or Instagram account, it's a very different animal than running government social media. So training, I cannot stress enough, is incredibly important. Even if it's 30 minutes, you sit down and you talk to somebody about how the settings work on Facebook. All of these things are incredibly relevant. So policies, policies, policies. Uh, we actually don't have a formal policy here for Skagit County for use of social media. We never had one. People just started doing social media. And now I'm trying to play catch up to, as Morgan kind of uh, elaborated on, what are we doing? 
Why are we on social media? What are we hoping to achieve here? And how do we write that down so that we have a standard document so that everybody can reference it and say, here are our overarching goals as an elected official's office. Here are our overarching goals as a department. How do we measure those goals? How do we make sure that we're really reaching what we, you know, what we intend to do? And if something goes wrong, if we have a viral incident, how do we lean on our policies to make sure that we're protected as a county? How are we supporting our employees to make sure we don't get into legal trouble? And in spite of all of these things, viral will happen. Something will go horribly wrong, and you may be all over the news, and you have no control over it at all. So what are you going to do? So let's talk about what happened to us. For us, it was July 14, 2016. And it was very much a day like any other day. It was a lovely summer day here in Skagit County. It was sunny. Everybody was happy. Uh, context setting a, a few days and a few weeks ago, I think there had been some high profile police shootings or other incidents in the news. So tensions were a little bit heightened across social media and in our community with regard to people's beliefs about law enforcement, whether they supported them or not. So about two o'clock in the afternoon, I happened to be sitting at my desk and I am an administrator on a lot of our Facebook pages. And I see this post pop up on our Gadget County Sheriff's Office social media page. And I will not read it to you, but I will let you skim through it. And my first thought was, well, my first thought was something I can't say here because we're on a, a professional conference call, but you can guess. So my next thought was, uh-oh. Gosh, I hope this doesn't go, go viral. And about an hour later, I realized that was silly because it had gone everywhere. Um, I alerted our board of commissioners. I alerted our county administrator. And I put a call in to our sheriff to say, um, really? Did, did, you, did you post this? Or, or you, know, you, you signed your name to it. I want to make sure this was you, in fact, and not someone else. And try to figure out what the logic was behind why this post came up. And if you've skimmed through this post, he said, well, you know, it's true. This happened. It was the truth. I wrote it because I got alerted by my deputies that this had happened, and I wanted to let the community know because it's true, and there were rumors that were starting on social media. And he said, I don't feel, you know, I'm, I'm not taking it down. I believe it's true. He was very firmly convinced that Putting this information out on social media, on government social media, as the sheriff of Skagit County was the most appropriate way to deal with this incident. So as you can see, we had a lot of very interesting comments that popped up right away. Some of them were very supportive of our law enforcement, saying, good, good for you. You don't deserve to eat somewhere like this where, where people don't support law enforcement. You know, we have a very tight-knit community, and we support our deputies. We think they're great. And then there were other folks who said that, wow, well, this is a huge abuse of government power. How dare somebody in a position of authority, such as the sheriff's office, have this discriminatory attitude towards a minority-owned business in our county? And compounding some of the issues we faced were the fact that the folks who do Facebook for Skagit County have not had a lot of social media training, any for that matter, and many of them may not be familiar with general best practices for communication. So they hopped on social media, and as you may see in some of these screenshots I'm going to be sharing here, they did a lot of responding to all of the comments, such as, Thank you for pointing out it was already on social media. People were not aware, and the only reason we posted this was to verify. Uh, clarifying that there was not a language barrier. Uh, saying that they appreciated people's sense of humor. You know, trying to, in some cases, appreciate the support they were getting from the community. Some of the comments that the Sheriff's Office posted were to clarify why they put the information up. But responding to all of the comments posted on social media, didn't really do anything to calm down the viral post, and in many cases, it actually inflamed it. Um, as you can see here, and I apologize, the magic of the internet, there are probably some inappropriate words. By, oh, that afternoon and late into the next day, we were starting to get things like, you're destroying a local business, it's unprofessional, 
um, why are we, you know, why are we allowing the sheriff to call them out? And then our office started getting phone calls. We started getting phone calls from people as far away as North Carolina saying that they were offering to sue the county on behalf of the restaurant owner because it appeared to be discriminatory. And our sheriff's office didn't really know what to do. Our, you know, unfortunately the sheriff is an elected official and I can provide strong advice suggesting in my experience and understanding of best practices and things like this that have happened around the country from which I have learned a few lessons that maybe the best thing for us to do is not continue to comment and respond to all of the posts on social media. You know, if it's already going viral, why continue to inflame the issue? And by the next day, which was July 15th, the Sheriff's Office had in fact stopped responding to all the comments and had made efforts to reach out to the business owner. As you will see right here, they posted a little update to their original comment saying, we have posted a new update saying that we have been in contact with the business owner in an effort to kind of calm down this viral post. But what you'll see here on the slide is this Facebook post from a very little small town sheriff's office has maybe, you know, a couple thousand followers on Facebook has reached 2.9 million people. That's, that's million, that's 2.9 million people. Within 24 hours of this post, we had friends on the East Coast who were saying, yeah, I heard some about your sheriff's office and this crazy viral post. Hey, what's going on with that? What are you guys doing? And this was a big eye opener for a lot of folks in Skagit County who just said, oh, well, it's Facebook. Well, I just posted it on Facebook. That's how we communicate with, with everyone. We, we didn't see anything wrong with it until they reached 2.9 million people and started getting a lot of phone calls and were inundated with uh, news media, we're inundated with lawyers, we're inundated with a lot of questions, and we're having to answer the question, well, what happens if this business shuts down? What happens, and this did happen, if there were folks in Tacoma, which is a town south of us, or other parts of the country who owned restaurants who happened to be called Lucky Teriyaki, they were getting threats as a result of one Facebook post by our sheriff's office, Lucky Teriyaki restaurants around our state we're getting threats, we're getting angry posts on their social media pages, people were coming in and some of them had to shut down. So it was, it was a big eye opener for our sheriff's office that even though this was the truth, this may not have been the best way to handle the incident. So what we learned is number one, it's not just Facebook. Let's be honest, it goes everywhere. And because it's true doesn't mean it needs to be said. You know, I understand that it was an emotionally charged issue for our sheriff and that he wanted to share that with the community. But one of the better alternatives might have been not to post on Facebook, but instead to, you know, what, what do we gain from stepping in? What do we gain as the county, as government, from stepping in and saying that this is an issue and taking a position on it? Is there a better way to deal with it that is perhaps let the conversation continue on Facebook? We don't need to be a part of it. And perhaps our role in this conversation is limited to confirming. Yes, I can confirm that this happened. Period. End of sentence. So step away from the conversation. Don't be a part of it. And as this business shut down for a time and other businesses also had to shut down because they were receiving threats around the country or at least around our state, how are you going to protect yourself? What records do you have that prove what you did, when you did it, who did it? How you responded? What information you had? What are we going to do if the business closes? We still don't know if we're going to be facing some kind of legal action because of this or not. But we do know that we have records retained through the Archive Social Crisis Support to make sure that all of the information we posted during this incident is retained and backed up. So if we get a public disclosure request, and in our state the public disclosure laws are pretty broad, you can request just about anything we at least have that documentation to provide on our behalf that legally protects us a little bit. And moreover, this just reiterates what we said before, this is a great example of training. We need training. You know, I, I hate to use this as a case study, but it is, and it's a prime example for why we need to sit our folks down and say, listen, it's not just Facebook. It's a big deal. What do we need to do to make sure that if you're gonna keep communicating on social media, and you want to communicate with your audience, 
and you want to provide the best information and be relevant and be truthful and honest and build a positive reputation, how do we best train you so that you can accomplish these goals? And that's something we're going to be working on here in the next few months once we get our social media policy done and once we can outline a training program for our staff to make sure that everybody has the uniform level of training, they understand what to do, what not to do, and who to go to for a resource if they get in a situation like this again and say, gosh, this didn't go well for us last time. How can we make this a positive success? How can we turn a negative into a positive on social media and make sure that we preserve our reputation as Skagit County? So that is our, that is our case study, and I, I really hope that none of you have to go through this. But if you do, you can use some of the lessons that we learned the hard way and apply them to your situation and come out of it looking positive. So I'm going to turn this back over to Morgan right now, and we'll hear from Anil here about social media archiving. Well, hey, Bronley, thank you. Real quick, we just have a minute here. Um, what was the outcome? What finally got posted? How, did, when did this, how long did this take to die down? Uh, you know, people actually still are posting comments on it. I see one or two new ones that pop up a week. Um, so I am still not sure what the outcome is going to be. Uh, our sheriff's office has learned uh, that they need to be maybe a little, think a little bit harder, do a little bit of critical thinking past the point of it's the truth and we need to post it. But if we post this, what are the outcomes? What are the potential ramifications? What could go well? What could go poorly? And based on that kind of critical thinking assessment, do we need to post it? So. We're still waiting to see kind of what's, what the fallout's going to be. Are, are we going to get any sort of legal action on behalf of the restaurant or not? For my part, what we're doing is we're trying to push through a good, solid social media policy for our county that we can get approved and by a resolution by our Board of Commissioners, and I can go around and actually start getting training out to people to, to make sure that we're using so, social media the best way we can. Absolutely. And folks, we didn't coordinate this. When I said policy, training, you know, technology, we didn't coordinate between us. So you see the importance of policy. So Bronley, great job. And now we're going to do this the right way this time. So I'm going to tell you about Anil here in just a minute. He's the founder and CEO of Archive Social and our next speaker. But before I do that, we've got a poll. So we're going to leave this up while I read his bio. But we want to know how is your agency currently retaining records of social media? So the first option is you're not retaining any records and you rely on the networks. That means, you know, Twitter, Facebook. You take manual captures, screenshots, copy and paste. Ooh, that's going to be, that's a tough way to do it, but are you doing it that way? You use a personal backup tool like Backupify, SocialSafe, you know, something like that. You use an automated solution for archiving, or you're already a happy archive social customer. So are you retaining your own records, not retaining them and relying on the networks? You take manual captures, you use a personal tool, you use an automated solution, or you already use Archive Social. So while you guys are answering that, let me introduce Anil to you. Now, Anil, it's always great when we get the founder and CEO on the phone. So he's the founder and CEO of Archive Social. They are the public sector's leading provider of technology that helps public agencies archive and manage risk related to social media. And if you wanted a case study on risk, Bronley just gave you one right there. This is why this is so important. Archive Social's technology is trusted by hundreds of agencies, including the city of Spokane, Sonohomish County, and the world's largest law firm, the U.S. Department of Justice. The company was selected for the prestigious Code for America Accelerator in 2013, recognized as a 2014 cool vendor in government by leading analyst from Gartner, and honored, and I'm proud to say this too, as a GovTech 100 company earlier this year by Government Technology Magazine. He's also the co-host of the wildly popular GovTech social podcast that I have had the chance to be a guest on. And let's take a look at the results here, Neil. 61% of the people are not retaining their records. They're relying on Twitter and Facebook. I know you're going to open some eyes uh, just in that area alone. Screenshots, about 13%. Personal tool, 3%. Automated solution, 5%. And wow, 16.7 are already a happy archive social customer. So Anil, it sounds like you got a lot to work with here. Morgan, I sure do. I appreciate the introduction. I want to thank everyone who's taken time out of your morning here on Tuesday morning here to join us for this presentation uh, and to hear this, this the situation that, that Bronley had to share. Uh, and on that, Bronley, I want to thank you for your participation. Um, as we've talked about many times in the, uh, personally one-on-one, -on -one, social media has tremendous undeniable benefits in terms of how you communicate with your audience. And so as we talk about some of these scary situations, we don't want anyone to lose sight of the fact that it is critical to be on social media 
day in and day out, social media provides, again, undeniable benefits. But because it is such an open platform for communication, there is so much transparency, uh, so much room for interpretation. Uh, there can be misunderstandings. Situations can go viral. And I want to thank you, Bronley, for uh, transparently sharing what happened here uh, and, and giving us some guidance on how you reacted. I know that you're not a stranger to, to viral situations uh, and crisis situations, going back to Snohomish, uh, also in Skagit County, the, the, the mall shooting. Uh, and so learning from your expertise uh, is, is greatly appreciated. Now, for all of you tune, tuning in, uh, Bronley said something early on about policy. She said, well, policy really is your friend. Uh, and I was really happy to see that, uh, and I really do agree with that. I know that a lot of you struggle with policy for a few different reasons. One is sometimes the policy might not make sense, right? You have to understand the policy before you can really buy into it. And second, executing on that policy, ensuring that you can implement it and enforce it can be a challenge. And so for the remainder of this presentation, I want to be a resource to all of you and provide guidance on, on both of those sides of the topic both on, on what is the policy around retaining records, why is it important to have this information in your control rather than on the social networks. Uh, and so we'll go through some other real-life examples and case studies to supplement the story that Bronley shared with you. Uh, and then we'll talk about that, that implementation. How do you actually enforce policy specifically around records retention uh, in, in terms of complying with records laws and, and having that legal protection. So I will do my best to share tips and tricks to you in regards to archiving and retaining social media. In full, full disclosure, our, our company, Archive Social, uh, we provide a solution in this space, uh, but we're not the only vendors. So today I want to provide guidance to you and again be a resource to you. And, and uh, as I get through my presentation, please do add your questions to the Q&A. And we will take time at the end to, to visit those questions and provide as much clarity as we can. So jumping right in, one thing that was striking to me was the initial uh, poll that we ran, uh, particularly given that we have an audience here, uh, at least partially out of the state of Washington, around public records. And, and, a, and a good chunk of you who had responded to the poll by the time we looked at the results had indicated that, that you do not believe that social media is a public record. And so I'm going to take a moment here to, to try to, to reframe the issue, hopefully change your mind on it, uh, by channeling what we're seeing across the country, and, and not just now, but across the last five or six years. Now, all of this starts with the records law that you have in your state. On the screen, I have an example from Washington State. Uh, but every state in the country has a public records law. Uh, and that records law is not specific to social media. It's not even specific to email. It's, it's in regards to the way that you communicate as a government. And in fact, the vast majority of records laws across the country share the same language. Uh, most of them have this phrase in here that says, regardless of physical form, uh, information that you, you transmit, send, receive, anything that, that you conduct in terms of communication that relates to the business of your agency, regardless of physical form, can constitute public record. So to make that real, if you received a complaint from a citizen, it doesn't matter if that complaint is on a piece of paper, in an email, or in a Twitter direct message. If you had a crime tip come in, it doesn't, again, matter if that was on a piece of paper, on an email, or on a Facebook comment. A crime tip is a crime tip, a complaint is a complaint, and it, it's really the nature of that content that matters. Now, this is how the law, uh, I'm interpreting the law this way, this is how, uh, this is how the law was written, but it's not just me, and, and it's not just you know one interpretation. Throughout the country, again, for the last five or six years, state by state, we have seen records authorities come out, whether it's the Secretary of State office, it is the, the uh, archives uh, division, uh, regardless of who it is, the governor's office, in, in almost, uh, I would say, a few dozen states now, they've clarified, yes, this in fact does mean that social media would be a record just like your email would constitute a public record. Now, in the state of Washington, in fact, in 2010, the Office of the Governor put out this guidance. Uh, and I've taken just a few snippets here, but the link to that guidance is available to you. We will share this out, and you can read the full document. But a few key snippets here is not only is social media a, a, a communication platform that generates public records, but you as an agency are responsible for capturing those records and then making them available. And, and again, in Washington State, uh, the guidance is that you must establish a mechanism of procedures to capture and retain. So having it on Facebook, Twitter, and these other sites uh, is not enough. You really need to have it in your possession. And we'll, we'll talk more about why leaving it on the network is a problem. And, and again, this is state guidance from Washington, but we have seen similar guidance uh, in states ranging from Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, Ohio, Texas, Oregon, and on and on and on. So 
that is the academic view of the issue uh, of social media being a record. But let's take a look at practicality uh, and what's happening uh, in, in real life. Uh, the situation that Brian Lee shared with, with this, this situation going viral and uh, initially responding but then having to step back, that in itself is a great case study. But let me give you some other examples of, that we've seen in recent history that uh, really make the case that records are being generated on social media that are not anywhere else, but they are of, of critical importance. Now, uh, the one I'll start with, this is a sensitive issue, obviously a, a just, just a horrific incident, uh, one of a few that we've experienced across the country just this past summer. Uh, but in Orlando, the worst mass shooting uh, in the history of the United States occurred. And obviously, uh, just a horrible incident, but also an incident in which communication is of critical importance, communication about the incident as it's happening and also afterwards. And, and I highlight this because we, we should talk about this. We should highlight the fact that social media, again, has tremendous undeniable benefits. In the heat of this moment, the Orlando police made a very smart decision. They said, on Twitter, all updates are coming from this Twitter account. No email or phone calls, please. They made the decision to use social media as the primary channel to disseminate information to allow the social networks to amplify the information. That's exactly what you should do in an emergency. That's what they did. But if you think about that, all that information coming out is just on the Twitter feed. It's not anywhere else. It's extremely critical information. And having a record of that, of course, makes sense uh, uh, in such a, such a uh, high-profile incident. Now, I, and I have some other examples. We go clockwise here. It may not be a, a crisis that's uh, in the real world, but as Brian Lee pointed out, with Skagit County, crisis, crisis situations can form online. Uh, and we had an incident with South Daytona uh, in Florida, which is a very small city, about 12,000 population. Uh, they had this. Uh, they had. A, they had a citizen post uh, a picture online of a dog's mouth being duct taped, tagging the city of South Daytona on, on her own personal feed. Uh, location tagging the city of South Daytona. And it turned out this citizen was not actually a citizen of South Daytona. She no longer lived there. She had moved elsewhere. But because she had location tagged the city, uh, this photo went viral. The city ended up getting tremendous uh, outcry from the citizens about animal cruelty, asking what the city was doing about this, criticizing the city for, for allowing this to happen. Uh, and so their social media went from a very, very sleepy presence of a handful of posts a day to more than 24,000 comments in a few days. Uh, and ultimately, they use social media to actually correct that citizen perception, to inform them, to, 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 to be very transparent and up-to-date. And ultimately, when the woman was caught in a different state, the citizens had changed their perception to, thank you, thank you, city of South Daytona. This wasn't a situation that you had that, that was in our locality, but you still helped out, and you informed us, thank you for doing that. Along the way, the national media made uh, public records requests for that information off of that feed. Uh, and again, 24,000 comments only on Facebook. How do, you, how do you swim through that? Well, you do need an approach to record keeping that allows you to find the information that's being requested. Uh, and, then, and then I'll circle through this uh, rather quickly in the last few examples. There are big crisis situations and there are small incidents. And, and here in my hometown where Archive Social is located in the city of Durham, uh, 911 became un inaccessible to a portion of the citizens. And so social media was used to get information about how you reach 911. Uh, and then finally, day to day, even if it's not, if, you, if you're not involved with emergency management, if you're not involved with public safety, uh, obviously in a crisis, arguably everyone's involved with those situations. But day to day, uh, you're providing uh, ideally service to citizens, and that's, that's fundamentally what every agency exists to do: is to serve the citizens. Social media provides perhaps the best channel to do that today. And so, answering questions, receiving feedback, uh, anything you do there could create records, particularly if there's a conversation around it. So those are high-level examples. Now, as you create records, the question comes up of, well, who's asking for it? Uh, and, and we'll go through some more examples here. But broadly, uh, people can ask for your social media very specifically, and we've seen that happen. But I want to really make it clear to everyone that the vast majority of time that social media is being requested, it's in a, a, more, in a blanket type of public records request. So if you look at that bottom box, any and all documents, all reports of the incident. I know a lot of us are dealing with weather-related events right now. On the East Coast, we had uh, the hurricane weather. Obviously, we're moving into the winter months here coming up. And so any notification of a street closure that, that goes out on your social, and then if you provide any clarification of that, that would fall under all notifications of the street closure. So more and more agencies that we work with are realizing that to truly respond to a records request, uh, social media is often a part of it, and sometimes social media is the is a prime component of, of that communication, of that type of communication. 
Uh, so don't uh, just wait for someone to ask you for Twitter or Facebook or think that's that's what the, you need to wait for um, to, to provide the information. We've actually had instances where uh, information gets requested and then uh, you know if, if it's been on your Twitter feed or Facebook and you haven't included that, that could be a problem and it could lead to overhead and costs. It's really important to think about your social as it's become a prime channel. Now, uh, when we talk about record keeping here in a moment, I'm going to provide some guidance, some tips and tricks, uh, but I want to share some success stories first to get you thinking about why this is so important and, and what it can do for you and your ability to continue to leverage these channels in a seamless fashion. Because ultimately, government is not a stranger to records requests or legal situations. Uh, because of how critical government is in, in, in people's lives, it touches people's lives in a way that can lead to litigation and lawsuits. And uh, the real key in government is being proactive uh, and, and, and prepared in a way that when that legal situation happens, you weather the storm and you can continue to do all of the great things that you can do and, and benefit from the channels that you have. And so starting out, uh, I'll just share three of the case studies that we have out of, out of the many from, from our customer base now. Last year, uh, speaking of weather-related incidents, San Marcos uh, and the state of Texas experienced some of the worst flooding in the history uh, of the country. In fact, the worst flooding in, in the state of Texas. And San Marcos uh, had uh, just put a social media archive in place prior to the first flood that occurred during Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and because they use social media, again, to communicate during this disaster, to coordinate emergency response, to correct misinformation from the from the press. Uh, they even use social media to help capture someone who was trying to run a fraud on, on the back of the flood. Uh, they had such critical information that they actually received records requests right after the flood. And that generally happens after a crisis. You, the crisis happens and then lots of records requests come in. And again, social media was at the forefront of it. They use the archive. Not only do they use the archive for responding to records requests, but the communications team then use it to analyze uh, the situation, rebuild the disaster timeline, uh, look at what citizens were, were seen to be concerned about, and that really paid off because six months later there was a second flood during the October uh, Halloween weekend, uh, and again, uh, having that information stored was, was a real benefit to them. Uh, on the West Coast, California, in regards to records requests, uh, this is a perfect example of, of social media being a core component uh, of a records request that's more broad. Uh, the police department was uh, doing doing the responsibility there of helping implement a gun buyback program. Uh, that's obviously a very controversial topic. The posts about that blew up on the Facebook page with lots and lots of controversy, clarifications, questions, and so forth. Uh, and soon after that uh, happened, uh, the National Rifle Association showed up uh, with a records request saying, we want uh, every record of all communications related to the gun buyback program. And again, the bulk of it and the really, the really, the really tangled information was on Facebook, really the, the information that's hardest to retrieve if it were to be done manually. Now, fortunately, Santa Barbara PD had signed up for a free trial of Archive Social three weeks before the NRA request came in. Uh, and so they really saw the value of being proactive and, of course, they're continuing to archive today. And finally, uh, in, in uh, Pacific Northwest and Spokane, Washington, this is one of our one of our earlier customers who, who who recognized the need for being having the record keeping. They recognized social media would have implications. They put an archive in place, and uh, in this situation, this is something that everyone does on social media. Every agency does this. They were simply communicating about a local event, about a kayaking trip that happens regularly. Uh, and unfortunately, on one of the kayaking trips, a, a young man died of hyperthermia, and so. Uh, the plaintiff's family issued a lawsuit, and they included the city in there, and they said, we want every uh, record of, 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 of when you communicated about this event on Facebook for the last two years to understand you know, the information you had put out in regards to safety precautions and when, when you would run the event when you wouldn't. Uh, and so this has nothing to do with public records per se, but it was a legal situation on just simply promoting that event and being, being a part of that as a city. Uh, the city gets pulled in, and then they have to respond to that, re that information request. And they have to do it in a timely fashion, because if you don't do it in a timely fashion, it's actually fines and, and, and other um, uh, you know, penalties that, that can come into place. And so they talked about how having an archive ensured that they could uh, not only respond in time, but actually respond correctly. They may not have been able to do any of that without uh, that proactive measure. So let's talk about archiving and record keeping. And again, uh, I want to give you some high-level guidance. Uh, I encourage every one of you to think about uh, records retention. I was really happy to see in the poll that outside of relying on the networks, the solution uh, in, in place right now is our technology, and others are using our automated technology. And so that's what I want to focus on is using automated technology and, and give you uh, a set of principles to, to think about 
as you evaluate record keeping approaches because it's not as simple as grabbing data from Facebook and having it. There are some, there are some intricacies there. Now, before I before I go through, hey, this is why you should think how you should think about archiving and how you should evaluate a solution. Some of you may be wondering, well, why can't I just keep this data on Facebook? Uh, the short story here is that Facebook does not guarantee the data will be there. Twitter does not guarantee the data will be there. No network has guaranteed that they will have the records that you are obligated to have as a government entity. In fact, Facebook has guidance on their law enforcement page that says, if you want some information from us, you can issue a subpoena, but please make sure you issue the subpoena before something is deleted. And that's the key. Information can get deleted, whether you delete it, maybe you don't delete it, but the citizens can delete it. So there's a lot of, a lot of room there for information to get lost. And again, over the years, you may get requested for something that happened four or five, eight years ago. Uh, and, and again, no guarantee of it being there is, is a real problem. That's again why the records bodies across the country are instructing agencies to take this information and get it in your control. Now, we at Archive Social uh, decided to take this one step for, further and, and wanted to understand how much data is being deleted because most people tell us, most agencies tell us that their policy is not to delete data. So in the month of January this year, we ran a study. Our technology can actually detect deletions off of Facebook pages in real time. And so we ran a study across 400 public agencies that we service. We're looking at their Facebook pages. And in one month, those 400 agencies lost nearly 7,800 records from Facebook. Nearly 20 a customer. Now, not every customer had something go away, but two out of, oh, sorry, three out of four did. So the va you know, vast majority of customers had some deletion. Some had dozens of records deleted. And if you talk to these agencies, it's a shock. It was a shock to us because nobody's expecting that much information to disappear. In fact, they would tell you that their policy is not to delete. Now, in some cases, staff was actually deleting content because government is distributed. And despite all the training you do, there are situations when human beings will make a choice to delete something even when the general policy is not to. But what happened more than that was that citizens were deleting content. Uh, and the biggest concern there is when citizens report some kind of issue that could be under uh, a record retention uh, schedule, the citizen can change their mind and delete it. A citizen can report a crime tip that's happened and they've deleted it and we've seen that happen. And so the citizens are often deleting content to you that you're responsible for. And once it's gone, it's gone. You, never, you can't even know that it was deleted uh, unless you have technology like ours. Uh, and then if a records request come in, the risk is that you don't have a record when someone else does. And so that's why it's really important. This data needs to be in your control. So let's talk about social media archiving technology. And ultimately, this is not about just grabbing data from Facebook and Twitter and having it somewhere. It is about being able to have the data that you're supposed to have and produce it when needed. There's four factors that I want to cover. This is how we thought about this uh, issue when we started creating this technology several years ago and, and, and put a focus on public sector. Uh, we want to get the data in your control as fast as possible because the longer it takes, then the more likely you could lose it. I want to be comprehensive. This is being broadcast in public. These uh, social media conversations have a lot of detail to them. Uh, and there's this issue of metadata, which I won't go into too much detail right now, but uh, the state of Washington and the state of Arizona have both ruled that metadata is part of the public record. And this is information that you don't see on the tweet or the Facebook post or on an email when you read it, but it's embedded in that electronic document that describes that, that electronic message. Authenticity, uh, this is really critical because uh, we're talking about legal. We're talking about legal concerns here. And, and you want those Facebook comments and tweets to hold up as legal evidence if needed. And then context, which I think was the most ignored in our industry of an archi as, as an archive industry, is it's not about storing data. It's about producing it, being able to make sense of it, being able to hand it off to somebody. Uh, and how do, you, how do you replay a Facebook conversation with hundreds upon hundreds of comments that happened two or three years ago? So... Well, how do you do that? Here's, here's how you can start looking at um, archiving. Whatever approach that you take, uh, and again, you can start with a manual approach. I, I would strongly recommend for, for your own sanity and for your own protection to, to move away from copy and pasting and screenshotting to something automated. Uh, and so when you're looking at automated technology, look for something that can go back and get the data from the network, because if you haven't been archiving, as most of, us ha most of the agencies here have not been, you need to start. And when you start, you want to go back to, to the beginning of time if possible. A uh, little trivia fact, this is the original home page from Facebook. Uh, and so look for archiving technology that can go back to the, to, to the inception of your accounts and get everything they possibly can get. Uh, our technology uh, will, will get whatever it can get out of Facebook from the inception. So something to look for there. Uh, and you also want to think about uh, what, all, what all is on that network. It's not just a timeline. You have a reviews tab if you've kept that enabled. You have private messaging. Um, you, have, you have all sorts of things on Facebook, on Twitter. You've got uh, your direct messages. You've got dimensions from the citizens, which are, which are communications received, uh, and so on and so forth. 
And finally, you, you want to get this as frequently as you can. Uh, and so look for technology that can get it within moments of it being posted, not within several hours or days. Now, on the metadata issue, I'm, I'm going to go, go, go through this real quick. Uh, I mentioned that, that this is something that's important. Uh, just to give you a visual, a tweet has 126 characters, but there's more than 2,000 characters of, of electronic data associated with that tweet. Uh, and so screenshotting will not get that information. You want to look for archiving technology that will get the full electronic record because uh, the, the two states in which this has gone to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court, in both of those states, has been ruled that electronic metadata is part of the public record. Now, really, really important as you look at archiving techniques, it's all in the details, devil's in the details. Uh, and so any technology that says they grab Facebook and, and archive it for you and they can produce it, really pay attention to what they're saying there. You know, are they getting the, the post with the imagery and the video? Are they getting all the comments? Are they getting the comments in response to comments? Are they getting, uh, let's look at this next slide here, are they getting the multimedia embedded within citizen replies, not just your own posts? I know you can post a photo, but citizens can comment back with photos. Uh, are you getting a live streamed information, so on and so forth? On Twitter, same thing. Twitter has multimedia. Twitter has short URLs. Oftentimes, owlies or bitlies or tiny URLs are used. Uh, you want to get that full context of that record. You want to know what that tiny URL was pointing to. So pay attention to the details because, because getting the basic information is fine, but oftentimes what's really being requested and what really tells the story and really can protect your agency uh, is inside those, those detailed level uh, responses and the multimedia that's been attached. Now, when it comes to actually producing the information, you, you, it's not just about producing a, a, a data dump of information. You really need to, to be able to produce what happened and, and, and ensure that you can, one, uh, prove that you have what you're supposed to have, but two, that when you hand it to somebody, there's not this crazy back and forth of them not understanding the data, them questioning whether you've produced everything. And so you want to look for technology that can not just re retrieve the data, but it can also replay it. This is an Instagram comment that gets replayed to the whole post. Same thing happens on Facebook, YouTube, other networks, replaying that entire conversation as one piece, including, again, live streamed video and other multimedia. Really important, not only in the product interface, but even in a PDF. And this is something that was really shocking for us. When you look at the archiving industry, most of the archiving vendors grew up uh, selling solutions to financial services companies and, and, and other private sector companies where Excel is king. Uh, and a compliance officer likes to deal with Excel, but reporters don't like to deal with Excel files of your tweets and, and your Facebook posts. Uh, the NRA and other, other, other advocacy groups don't like to deal with that. In fact, it, it'll create a back and forth. And so you really want PDF, and you want to be able to, again, reconstruct what happened. So in our example here, this is Margate, Florida. They were dealing with a, a spam situation where a, a person kept spamming their, their own business. Uh, and then deleted, and then, and then the city ended up removing those comments, and then that person issued a records request for what was removed. Uh, we can find everything that was removed, but we need to reconstruct the entire conversation around it. And so on the left side, you can see the two pages of the PDF that were re recreated. And then on the right side, what's highlighted is actually what was being requested. But you can say, this is what we requested, but here's the full context. And it really creates a lot of peace of mind for you, ensuring that you're producing everything you need and again, limiting that back and forth interaction. Uh, last but not least, an archive does not have to be just about legal. Uh, most of who, who we work with are, are PIOs, communications managers, and so forth. And, and having an archive of your social media is, is, is very helpful from a communication standpoint. But think about also technology that, that you can layer on top of that archive. Here at Archive Social, we're developing technology that can alert you and help you uh, enforce your policy when there are policy violations. We can get you email alerts for anything that may be critical, such as an emergency uh, situation or a mention of, of a council member uh, on social media. Uh, and then we can give you analytics and reporting out of the archive. So really try to look for, look for technology that not just doesn't just store this data and you never think about it, but how can you, how can you uh, get multiple benefits out of an archive uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to help you succeed on social media and, and continue to, to protect your agency day-to-day. -day. Uh, and then finally, Broadly mentioned this briefly, crisis support is something that, she, that Skagit County leveraged. And, and I want to put this in front of you because when Skagit County had this viral situation, uh, and Broadly, to her credit, recognized that record keeping would be vital here, uh, she turned to Archive Social's crisis support initiative. This is a pro bono initiative, no cost to a government agency, where if you are in the midst of a crisis, whether that's a, a real world physical crisis or it's an online generated crisis that's overwhelming you as a communicator, over, overwhelming your staff, could lead to public records requests and legal situations. We will provide access to our technology at no cost for 30 days. The only string attached is that we want your feedback. That's it. No cost for 30 days. We will help you out because, again, the benefits of social media are undeniable. 
uh, and, and we've had the benefit of, of building a business working with public sector hand in hand. We appreciate the opportunity to work with agencies and any agency that has not yet able to institute an archive in place to, to assist day to day with with the, with with the legal protection needed, but is in a crisis can still benefit from from our technology. So check out this website. And I'll wrap up here with 10 minutes to go. Here's my direct contact information. If I can be helpful to you in any way, please don't hesitate emailing me directly. Uh, and I'll hand back to Morgan for questions. You bet, Anil. Hey, great. And I think uh, that one slide may not have come up, so folks, I'm going to put it on there for just a minute so you can copy that down. It's uh, HTTP, you know, uh, forward slash, forward slash, govcrisis.social. So make sure you write that down, little folks. It will also be in the PDF that we sent out. And folks, uh, keep the questions coming in. Uh, we want to be able to get to those. And so, look, we've got just uh, about 10 minutes left here. Uh, everybody's been asking. We've got a lot of comments. You will get uh, a link to this presentation along. If you want to download the slides, the PDF is the bottom. Is at the bottom? I know we've had a lot of comments about wanting to get to some of the stats. So, folks, that will all be there. So, actually, we have a question that came in. Um, and just a real quick one for you, Neil, too, because we've got a couple here from Ron. I um, want to know if you're working with any California state governments or uh, – I think it's California, yeah, CA. So um, hopefully it's not Canada, but I think you're working in, you're working through California quite a bit, aren't you? Uh, absolutely. We're working with, with, with dozens upon dozens of cities and counties, and we have state agencies uh, in the mix there. And then if this is Canada, we also do work with agencies in Canada. Uh, but um, to, to, to Alice, who asked the question, uh, I'm happy to provide some direct references if you want to email me, uh, neil at archivesocial.com. I will also send out my contact information. Uh, happy to provide references, and we can go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, Bronley, let's let's get one. This one's for you. So, um, what was what would you say was probably the biggest lesson you learned after this incident, while this incident was occurring? I mean, what things did you find out you didn't know what were going to happen? And then, what was when this was all done, when the dust was all settled? What do you think was probably the biggest takeaway, not just for you, but probably for your sheriff or for the county? Uh, I would say honestly, the biggest thing we learned and our biggest takeaway were the same thing. Um, which is the power of social media and the need for training on social media. Uh, they had the sheriff's office had been operating their Facebook page fairly successfully for some time and never had any issues. They received you know tips and messages. They would share important information about driving safely when school starts and all of those helpful things. They had an ask the deputy uh, section. It was all very well received, but it was this particular piece of content that went out that went bigger and faster and farther than anybody expected. And when something like that happens, if you haven't had the experience or the training to know how to handle it or, or think through the ways you could handle it, you can end up in a lot more trouble than you ever imagined. So uh, for me, that was, that was our big takeaway is, man, do we need training? And for them, uh, for the sheriff's office and a lot of our elected officials, it was social media is a bigger deal than we think we thought it was it because just because it went so viral so quickly and because they started getting so many calls and emails and and so much feedback from the public not just within our county or our state but from across the nation and Anil how often do you get that same kind of response that Bronley just talked about when you work with these agencies like on your uh, uh, crisis.social link when they need the help or they have a situation come up and they already have you. Are, are you seeing some of the similar things in terms of the takeaways in these big aha moments, especially around training? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I can uh, count on more than my two hands uh, how many situations we've heard about that were uh, not, not externally generated. They were generated by some staff member, again, trying to do the right thing, trying to relay the facts of the situation. but. Uh, everything's open for interpretation and can be can be misinterpreted or it can it can touch the court uh, in the wrong way. Uh, and so this comes up quite a bit. And I think again, Bronley is, is an expert in this area. For better or worse, Bronley, I know you've you've had your fear of crisis situations, but you've you've done an exemplary job of, of dealing with them. And and sometimes we see the response being uh, to over communicate, 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 communicate. Uh, as we saw with the South Daytona situation where uh, the photo, again, was not from a citizen in South Dakota. The police in the city did not do anything wrong, but they were receiving the outcry, and they used that over-communication to, to be transparent with the citizens and let them know that they were on the citizens' sides, uh, and that, that did shift that perception 180 degrees. Um, and then, as, as Bronley mentioned, sometimes it makes sense to step back. And now, I will tell you that, uh, just like Skagit County experienced, uh, many of our customers, uh, even with very modest social media uh, activity, decided to start archiving, and it really paid off huge for them because you cannot anticipate 
this type of viral situation. Uh, you don't need it until you need it, uh, and then you really, really need it, right, at that point. And so we've seen that happen over and over. Yeah, one of my favorite sayings is emergencies don't make appointments, so you never know when it's going to show up. So, um, Bronley, going back to that, had it not been for this incident, how much tougher would it have been for you to get a policy through to get the uh, attention to the county commission? And plus, you're in a unique thing, too. You're dealing with an elected official as opposed to, like, say, a chief of police or somebody else who might be appointed uh, you know, or not voted in. So uh, how did this incident help accelerate some of your own plans to get a policy in place? Uh, it made a big difference. Uh, you know, I can give people examples all the time of other places I've worked or other jurisdictions who I know have had uh, similar issues. But, you know, like most government, we're overworked and understaffed, and everything's a priority. So when I tell our legal team and our records folks that having a social media policy and having records retention built in should be a priority, they say, yeah, yeah, just add it to the list. Um, this became so big, so quick, that it really kind of, it helped drive through my point that, listen, this can happen to us, it can happen to anyone, it doesn't have to be a, a natural disaster, a weather-related emergency to become a crisis. So, you know, if, if your goal, and when I say you, if I say if our government's goal, our elected officials, our commissioners, our prosecuting attorney's office, if their goal is to manage the risk for the county to make sure we're not in any legal hot water, I don't know why this isn't a priority. So this really helped kind of shove that message right up to the forefront. So, you know, hopefully within the next couple weeks here, we're getting through our final draft of our social policy. Everybody's re uh, reading, reviewing it, making changes that we can get something in place, even if it's not perfect, even if we update it and change it as technology and our staff and our training uh, evolve, we have a document in place that ensures that we're protected, we, we have training, training is required, and I know as of last week, Gadget County now has a contract with Archive Social to retain all of its social media records should something crazy happen again, like for example, we uh, a couple weeks ago had a shooting at the Cascade Mall in our county, and we're probably going to have a small news item today involving protesters in a pipeline. So I, I feel comfortable knowing that we're legally protected and also positive knowing that people really understand the, the relevance and importance of social media as a communications tool and why we need to have policies and retain all of this information. So I have to tell you, I, I'm on a lot of law enforcement lists being a former cop. I, I actually saw that one come across, and I quit piling on on these because, to your point, you get so many comments, it's hard to find out really what the truth is. So that's part of the issue, too, is, uh, you know, you see get some people don't want to pile on because it, it gets so tough to really get down to what's really happening. Hey, Neil, this one's for you. Um, this one came into, there are so many platforms out there right now. I mean, we, we, first it was Facebook, then it was Facebook and Twitter. Now we've got Instagram. Now we've got YouTube. What are the platforms that you see most people using, and how often are you capturing these things? And then if you would also touch on real quickly, um, uh, uh, Bronley mentioned that they just got a contract with you. I know cost is always one of the issues with government agencies. So would you talk about the number of platforms and then hit the cost issue real briefly? Sure. Now, if you don't mind me flipping that uh, that order of that, because yep. when, when Bronley said, you know, I don't know why when this is uh, a risk to your agency, you know, why would you not prioritize it? Um, yeah, one of the keys that we, we, we've – we figured out there's there's a lot of things that that need to be done, uh, but obviously cost and time or these are limited resources. And the key is making this very 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 easy and very low cost, so that it is a a quick win and, and it, you can tackle something very important uh, without without getting completely distracted having you know IT deployments. And it has to it has to make sense from a cost standpoint. And so uh, on, on the cost standpoint. Um, our pricing is public. It's transparent. We, we sell transparency, so our, we operate transparently. It's on our website. We've designed our pricing to be under 5000 annual for about 80% of agencies in the United States, and that was very intentional because we know that 5000 is a, is a magic mark, a, a threshold of, of discretionary spend for many agencies. So we want to make this an easy cost uh, that if you have some leftover budget, if you have a discretionary budget, um, it's something you can put in place. And then in terms of, of, of the time, uh, the vast majority of our customers set this up in less than 15 minutes. So 15 minutes connecting those accounts, getting the history, it's there actively moving forward. As long as you have the social networking credentials, it takes 15 minutes. A very easy win for something that's important. Now, uh, on, on your other question, uh, Morgan, I'm going to ask you to, to kind of repeat it so that I can answer it you know, more, most well, directly because I don't want to make sure <laughs> go offline there. Yes. Yeah, it's just the proliferation of all these platforms. First it was Facebook, then it was Twitter, then it's Instagram, then it's YouTube. So what are you finding are the most popular platforms um, that you're dealing with, and how many of those is Archive Social capturing right now? 
Okay, that's, so the most popular. That's what I wanted to make sure. So, so there are some platforms that are that are that are being talked about quite a lot. But to be very clear, the most popular are still the ones that 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 we all recognize: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, those remain the most popular. Now there are some up and coming networks that are generating a lot of buzz and excitement. Uh, one example is Periscope. Last year, really came out live streaming was this new thing. Uh, generate a lot of excitement. It's something that we do now archive um, as part of our part of our, part of our Twitter capture uh, because of a lot of demand from customers. But one thing we'll, we'll also see with these new platforms is that we'll see these new platforms come out um, and provide something differentiated. But I think we'll continue to see the, the the major platforms then consolidate and bring those feature sets in. So as Periscope came out on Twitter, Facebook then went and created live streaming. So the same thing I think will happen as you see with, with Snapchat. Instagram obviously came out with something similar to, to Snapchat stories, with Instagram, Instagram's uh, feature set. So I think we'll see some consolidation there. And so that's one thing that we're monitoring. Uh, we continue to, to stay in touch with our customer base on, on what they're using. And, and a big big issue there is a lot of our customers want to use the latest and greatest platform, but record retention is so important that um, sometimes you have to hold back a little bit until you have the record keeping in place. And so as soon as the platforms uh, get a certain level of usage, they tend to make their data available at some point, and then they can be archived, right. and then you can be protected on those platforms. And, and folks, there's a lot more questions, but we've got to be respectful of your time, so we're right at the top of the hour. So uh, within the next 48 hours, like I said, you'll get a link to the recording, share it with your colleagues. And uh, make sure, uh, first of all, though, big thank you to Bronley uh, Mishler. Uh, thank you for being on. That was such a it's a lot of transparency there, and we appreciate you doing it. Also to our great partners at Archive Social and Anil, you guys have always been top notch in helping us out. So, uh, folks, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me here. Just know that within the next 40 hours, you will get a link to this webinar and a download uh, of the PDF is available down at the bottom. So, we want to thank you for attending this webinar, and we hope to see you very soon on another government technology webinar. Everybody, have a great day.